Hi everyone, it's Paul here. So happy, uh, yes, Easter, Passover, Monday or day 22 in the United Kingdom's lockdown, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, so it is a happy Monday. Let's have a look at the images that we've got this week. Um, so everyone's saying hi. So UK, Germany, Malaysia. Wow, well, I was late there. Um, hi, Paul from my RV in lockdown in Northern Italy. <laughs> um, hi, Bruce. Hi, David from France. Cool. Loads of Malaysia. Cool. Okay, let's um, let's get into our software. So again, normal stuff. A um, couple of procedures. So firstly, um, there is about a ten to fifteen second delay uh, between if you post a comment and me seeing it. That's because of the way that Facebook Live works. Um, so bear in mind there might be a little bit of a, a delay for me to get to see you um, to be able to make any changes based on what you've asked. But please. Do ask stuff as we're going. Um, if I do something that confuses people, then just let me know. Um, if I do something that you don't agree with, let me know. If I, if I am doing something that you think, why would he do that? Then please let me know. Um, we'll try and cover it from uh, from every perspective. Uh, Paul Crikey, we've got Mexico, we've got Champagne, we've got Switzerland. Positive for Anne Valerie. Oh, hi, <laughs> I know Anne Valerie. Uh, positive for being in Champagne is you get to enjoy your lockdown, I guess. Uh, a little more than some of us do. Uh, Switzerland, cool. And Mr. Smith's online, cool. Uh, right, so let's get going. Uh, first thing to talk about, we are in version 20.0.4. That's the latest version of Capture One at the point that this video is recorded. If you watch this later and there's a later version, then some of this stuff might not apply. But if you're watching it relatively recently, then most of the tools that we're running through will, cover, will be covered in Capture 120. Uh, the options for getting hold of Capture 120, anyone can download a free trial. Um, Capture One offer it free for 30 days with no restrictions or any stupid watermarks or anything. Uh, or if you want to buy a copy at the moment for this month, um, there's 25% off the pro version. There is 30% off upgrades and fun time. Uh, tomorrow, no, day after tomorrow, so you've got two more days um, to enter the competition. Um, so we're doing it in conjunction with Capture One. They have a 30-day challenge for editing. Um, 10, 15-minute challenges every day um, that you can sort of nip in and out of with tips and tricks. You don't have to do any of them, but some of them might be quite useful and quite interesting. If you go to that page, so our website, so poorreefer.com slash edit with us, uh, you will get access to that competition. Um, answer a very simple question. And it's a really easy clue because if you click on the link, it will tell you the answer. Um, so go to that page, um, answer the question, and hopefully you win one. Failing that, if you don't want to, um, as I say, make use of the discounts that they've got at the moment on Capture One. Okay, uh, loads of people online. Ooh, we've got quite a gang today. Cool. Um, good morning, Mr. Shedlars. Hi, Luis. Oh, you already have it. Cool. Uh, and Mike in Banbury. Right, let's go into Capture One. So we've got a few things um, today, um, quite a few images. Um, some of them uh, have a little bit of a gotcha in them. Um, certainly, I think it was this image, which we're gonna come back to um, from Esteban. Um, so some of the stuff that when we're importing images, Capture One does some clever stuff, but you need to be aware of it. So we're gonna cover some of that. But first off, let's start with a, actually a relatively tricky edit um, in the old days. Um, and by the old days, I mean, the days before we used to do digital editing, because then, of course, you'd be reliant on pure glass filters. Um, yes, you could do some dodge and burn stuff in, in the dark room, but um, this is a photographer's nightmare out in the field. And the reason is because our standard filters, let's just put one on in software just so you can see it. A gradient filter goes solid from dark all the way to light, and you can get hard filters, which is great. So you can get a filter that transitions very quickly. But the result is that at any point on this image, I'm gonna chop off part of the shadows. So the whole point of a filter is to even up the exposure. So we have a dark part of the filter in one part of the piece of glass or resin, and we have a light part in the other. And then the gradient in between is what makes it a graduated filter. And neutral density refers to the fact that it shouldn't affect the color. But unless you had a filter that was this exact shape, so light here, and then it went up here, oops, sorry, I need to get rid of that mask. So it was light here or dark here, and then it went up here with the light area, and then down again, and then up, and then down again, and then there's no way on earth you can get this correctly exposed directly out of camera. So typically we then refer to maybe an HDR process where we take more than one shot, and of course you can do that in this scenario. Um, but then you also end up with some challenges around things like the flag um, waving and maybe this um, wind or weather vane is, is moving as well. So there are things that will move between the two frames that make stitching a little more difficult. And 
we also have in here a person. And people are wonderful in photos because they give us a sense of scale, but they're a real pain in HDR because people have a habit of moving. So let's try and do this with software instead. Um, so this is a shot from Dean. Uh, let's first off, let's go into our camera settings. So up here, lens correction. Um, just as normal, chromatic aberration, let's click on our analyze button. It's picked up the right lens, but I want it to do the work on this exact setup with that lens on that sensor. Um, at f8, we shouldn't have much in the way of diffraction. Um, we shouldn't have much in the way of purple fringing around here. It looks pretty clean. It's not bad. But what we do have in here is quite a bit of noise, and we'll see that in a second when we load it up. Um, what we've also got is a little bit of vignetting or, or darkening at the edges on this lens. However, we might actually use that to our benefit in a minute. So let's go into our exposure tab. So that's the one that looks like a histogram. So all of these tabs that I'm going into are the stand. We've purposely left Capture One as the standard setup. You can change, and we took, covered this, I think, in um, session one, but again, we can go through it again. You can add pool or tools onto this. You can move them into what's called the pinned area, so the area that stays still at the top. You can remove them. We can add in entirely new um, sets of tools in here onto whatever tabs we want. So your own workflow, it's better if you actually work out the tools that you normally use to process and then put them into tabs in orders that, that make sense to you. But in this case, we're just using the standard defaults that Capture One gives us. So under the exposure tab, we're on our background layer. Background affects everything. So first off, and, and as always with all these things, let's try and work out what we're dealing with. So let's turn the exposure warning on. That's going to tell us that these areas here are overexposed as it currently stands. So what that means is in the histogram, there is some information that's off here to the right. Um, so beyond 255 on the histogram. We know that the camera's dynamic range is recording a lot more than what we're actually seeing in those JPEGs, so or, or even the raw file when it's first loaded in. So let's pull our exposure down and see how much more data we've got. And actually, we've got quite a lot. So whereas before, let me just temporarily undo that. Let me just turn the exposure warning off. So without that change, we've got some areas here that are very, very, very blown out. With that change, We've got all this detail. So that's great. So we know that we can recover the detail on the highlights. So the highlights don't worry me at all now because we know that we can get that back. Now let's look at the shadows. So because obviously there's a lot of information in here and there's a lot of stuff in this structure. But we want to get some of it back. So let's pull up the exposure. So at this point here, I'm starting to see the detail. I'm seeing the windows here. I'm seeing the brickwork here. That's great. I'm seeing tiles on the roof of the windmill, which is great. And Let's go in really close. Now, here's the downside. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Um, what you're also seeing is a huge amount of noise. So noise comes from the shadows. Um, so here's, here's the challenge that we have as photographers. Um, when we're taking a picture, you're gonna see highlights. When they go over, then you just lose all information. You have nothing there to play with. So once it goes brighter than bright, or the brightest part that your camera can record, it doesn't have a choice. It's just recording nothing. It sees white, and that's it. In the shadows, the camera actually sees quite a lot more than you're going to see when you first bring in the RAW file or first have a look at the JPEG. But once you go off of the end of this histogram, what's also going to be um, incorporated in that image is noise. And this noise in particular is basically where the camera couldn't quite see what it is. So it's using stuff that's coming off the sensor. It may be heat off the sensor. It may be little bits of flex of light that it's seeing that's coming out in all of this sort of messy stuff. And we want to fix that. We can in Capture One. So version 20 came up with some much better noise reduction tools. We'll use that in a second. But this is about getting the balance between pulling up enough shadow to be able to see the detail, but not so much that we're introducing noise um, into the image that shouldn't really be there in the first place. So on our little magnifying glass tab up here, which is actually known as the details tab for Capture One, we've got in here focus, we've got sharpening, and we've got noise reduction. So on here, I'm going to pull up our luminance noise reduction. I'm just going to use this as a benchmark here in the windmill. Remember, we're at 400% at this point. So this isn't really fair on the image itself, but it's a way of making sure that if we can get rid of a lot of the noise at this level, when I get to 100%, it'll look nice and clean. So let's pull our luminance slider up to hmm, about there, 77, 78. That's a lot cleaner. Um, we've got so it now looks a bit more like paintwork on a on a structure rather than uh, rather than dots and a dapple effect. 
Here is a lot cleaner for noise, but we've lost a little bit of detail, so we've got some tricks that we can use to, to pull that back. What I wouldn't do is use sharpening. So the reason that, that sharpening causes a problem is sharpening happens to introduce noise. So we've just spent all that time trying to pull back um, the, the noise, or increase the noise reduction to pull back the detail without increasing noise. And then we go and introduce some new noise by sharpening the image. So instead of that, what we will do is use our structure slider in here, which has the effect, if you do use it sparingly, do not do it too much. If I do it too much, you can see how horrible this now looks. We've got halos everywhere. We've got these bright lines and dark lines. And the reason is that structure is looking for edges. So it's an edge enhancer. Remember um, the last session we talked about clarity being a mid-tone and area enhancer. Structure is an edge enhancer, which is great for pulling out detail. But if you do it too far, like I have here in intentionally, it also introduces horrible noise and also these halos. So again, with all of these sliders, use them sparingly. But that sort of works to me. Now, remember, we're at 400% and we've pulled our exposure up by two stops. We're probably not going to do that in the final image, but this is a good way of saying, actually, if this is acceptable to me at 400% and with our exposure higher than what I wanted, then it's going to be good when I go to print it at 100%. It should be fine. Okay. So let's pull our exposure back down to what it was. Ooh, big difference. So we can see how much uh, information we've actually got in the image that, that wasn't there in the first exposure. We don't want to remove the whole feel of a silhouette. It doesn't make sense to the eye. If we do that, so let's just use all of our sliders to their maximum extent. So highlights, let's reduce completely. Whites, reduce completely. Shadows, up completely. Blacks, up completely. Now we have one of those horrible Instagram photos. Um, this is the, the worst of HDR. Um, I've seen quite a lot of them around over the years, but we're going to stay away from that. And the reason is, A, it looks horrible, frankly, but B, it doesn't make sense to our eyes. How can I possibly be looking into the sun and have all of this lot illuminated unless I had 300 flash guns behind me or, a, I don't know, a Fresnel bulb or something uh, illuminating it? It just doesn't make sense. So fundamental thing, the photographs got to make sense. So let's reset all of those sliders. And what we're going to do is very carefully pull up our shadows. So let's just do that a touch. So about 30 on there, 30 on the scale. So the scale goes from 0 to 100 and down to minus 100. I'm also going to pull up black on the slider. So remember, shadows pulls up the bottom 30%. So that was everything that was sat in here on the histogram. Blacks is going to attach the bottom 10%, so this little spike here, and that's things like these tiles up here on the on the windmill. So as I do this adjustment, we can see it's not really affecting things like this wall, which is a shadow, but it is affecting the stuff that's really, really, really dark in the image. So let's pull it to about there. So at this point here, I've got enough detail here, but I haven't overdone the image. So we haven't overcooked it. We haven't made it look fake. Okay. In fact, I'm going to pull it back just a touch more just to there okay so now um, we've, we want to make the, the subject of the image about the, the windmill obviously but also the sky uh, before we do any of that though what I am going to do is fix this lean of the flagpole so I don't know whether this ground was completely flat it may have been it may not have been but what I do know is typically a flagpole is vertical and normally when builders are building windmills they tend to build them um, straight up as well so keystone tool up here I'm not going to use the four-way keystone because I've got no idea what is horizontal. But I do know what should be vertical. So let's use this one over here. And again, I don't want to do it just into this tight little area here because it allows for a tiny little mistake to have a big impact. But we can use this virtual dotted line that it gives me. And I can say, well, OK, let's go there. And I can see that that's halfway through that flagpole. And I'm going to go out to here which again, oh, not quite. So let's just pull that line in just like half a degree of nothing. There we go, down to the middle. Okay. And let's do exactly the same on this side, but this side we've got to guess it a little bit more. So we're going to have to make a little bit of a guess as to where the middle of the windmill is, about there on the bottom. Uh, let's go there. And where the middle of the windmill is on the top, let's go for about there. And generally speaking, a good clue as to whether or not the keystone is correct is if your camera was level horizontally and looking up and looking down, so looking straight up or looking straight down, the parallax effect would be equal on both sides. So what I'm looking for is are these angles 
roughly mirroring each other. If they are, then we're probably not far wrong. Hit apply. We now have a straight flagpole and a straightened windmill, much better. We're losing all of this area out here. It's going to automatically crop that area out. But I'm not too worried because there's no detail in there. There's nothing of massive interest in there. So let's just hit our arrow button. Okay, now we've got a much more leveled image. Looks a bit more clean. Um, and now we can start to adjust the sky. So let's add a new layer, so this little plus sign. I don't want a filled layer or anything clever. I just want an empty layer, so I can click on empty layer, or I can just click on the plus sign, that will give me one. And I'm going to say sky. Okay. So with our sky, I'm going to draw a gradient filter. So this is almost like it would be if I'd used a gradient filter when shooting. I don't know whether you had at this point, but um, either way. So there's my gradient filter. I'm actually going to have quite a hard fall off here. Just going to rotate it around a little bit. Okay. The reason I'm rotating it that way is I want it to affect this sun quite a bit. I need to be a bit careful with this ground, but you'll see why that's not a worry in a minute. And I want it to ease off over here. So I'm going to have a less, more of an effect lower down on this side than I am on this side. Our fun little tool, Luma Range. So with our Luma Range, I'm going to say, well, I want to affect everything that's bright but I want you to leave alone anything that was in the shadows. Because when we make this darker, I don't want to make the shadows even darker. We've just spent time fixing them and bringing them up. So with that, that looks pretty good. I'm going to fall it off quite smoothly and increase our radius. So we remember um, a couple of sessions ago, um, we went through the fact that these masks, especially on Luma masks, to make them look realistic, this is the grayscale version, um, what I've got to do, so if I put this radius down hard and this down hard, you see how hard that line is. And if I were to do that, uh, let's turn the mask off and now affect my exposure, we get this hard, hard line all the way around things. It looks horrible. Whereas if I change that range now to have what's called a fall off, so almost like a feathering at the edges, that's improved it a little bit. But also, we're going to increase our radius. So you see how all of that's now softened? And that's because it's now effectively blurring the edge of the mask and making the edge of the mask softer. So we now have our mask there. I'm not actually going to use the exposure tool because that's just going to make it stormy. Instead, what we're going to use in this particular area is a bit of highlight recovery, not too much, a lot more white recovery, and we're going to boost some saturation. Like there. Okay. Now on our background, I'm actually going to change our white balance just a little bit. So we're going to pull up what's called the Kelvin, so the temperature of the, the light. So light temperature changes throughout the day. It goes from very cold, harsh light, what we refer to as daylight, at about 5,500. At sunset and so on, it can be down to sort of 3,200 or so. Um, and then the reverse um, in a stormy day and so on. So what we're looking for is something that feels like sunset. I could click with this little pipette onto the white of this wall and say okay well that's what if that wall should have been white then this is what the the light should have been but remember i said a couple of sessions ago when we're talking about sunset and sunrise the color of the light that's coming and hitting that wall actually means that the wall wouldn't have been flat gray or a, a white um, or a gray scale it would have had some color to it so picking on a wall at sunset doesn't make any sense to a certain extent we've got to play with this a little bit so what we do is we pull up our kelvin so the warmth of light and then we might adjust our tint a little bit Maybe to there, that starts feeling a bit more like a sunset. Yeah, that's pretty nice. So by doing all those things, we've got some detail still in these windows. So remember, we pulled up the shadows um, in those windows. We've still got all the detail here in this hut. But again, it should be in silhouette. So I don't want to particularly bring this up too much. I want to be able to see that this was in silhouette and the subject is this shape against this sky. Let's add a new one called Sky Gradient, because on this one in particular, I want the ability to turn it off. So that's why I'm creating this as a new layer. And on this one, I'm going to have a very, very soft gradient. And I'm going to pull our exposure down. But when I do that, remember when I pull the exposure down, I might also be bringing down some of the saturation as well, and we start looking stormy. So just bringing the exposure down on its own doesn't help me. What I'm also going to do then is pull up the saturation a touch. So that gives us a bit more warmth and a glow in the sky. Then let's create a new one called foreground. 
And this is about the fact we don't want to lose this foreground at all, um, but we do want the eye to go straight up. Um, and I know, um, I think this one is Dean's, isn't it? Yeah, and Dean's, um, he actually sent me one of the edits that he'd done on this and exactly the same thing he'd, he'd done on here, which is to me the correct thing to do, which is draw the attention up um, the frame. Um, so on this, this gradient, I've got the ability just to draw a gradient, just like I always have done. So I can stretch it just like that. I can make it a hard gradient or I can make it a soft gradient. But what I also have is I hold down the option key and grab one of the ends and I can affect the, what's called the fall off without affecting this part. So this is still 100%, this is still 50% in the middle. And then this part here is, is down to zero. Holding down the option key in Capture One means that I can make that transition as hard or as soft as I want it to be. So in this case, I want it to fall off quite quickly um, up towards the windmill. Press M to get rid of your mask. And then with this one, we're gonna pull down our exposure a little touch there okay cool now one final little trick what we're going to do is we're going to pull on oops wrong one let's delete that mask i'm going to hold down my um, mouse button and instead of creating an empty layer we're going to create a filled layer so the filled layer means effectively if i press the m button to see the mask everything is masked at 100 percent um, whereas a standard layer if i just click it once i get nothing masked and it's only what i draw that gets applied so with a full layer, now I can play with my levels a little bit. Um, what I can do is I can pull this middle slider. So I, what I don't want to do, obviously we've just spent time correcting these um, highlight uh, blowouts, and we've spent time correcting the shadows. What I don't want to do is make the shadows darker and the highlights brighter. That doesn't make any sense. It's just undone everything we've done. But what I can do with our levels um, slider is I can adjust the midtones a little bit. So I can make the midtones darker, or as I want to in this one, just make it subtly a little lighter. And then overall with this, I'm gonna pull our saturation up a little bit. Saturation is probably a slider I use the least, but in this case, it's gonna help us. Um, I'm also gonna pull up our clarity a touch, to about 21 there, nice. That would be it in my head. Um, so if anyone's got any questions on it, then yell. Um, but obviously with all of these layers, we can adjust how much they apply. So if I didn't like what was done to the sky, I've got this opacity slider here and I can reduce it or I can put it up to full extent again. Um, let's just pull up our browser and I'm gonna create a variant of this and go back to the original. So that was our original file. Um, it's exposed as well as you can get in this situation without um, cutting a line across uh, the windmill with a, a glass filter. And that's our final processed image. So we've got all the detail in there. We haven't brought up too much noise. What we have got though is a straightened image. Um, so the, the flagpole is straight, the windmill is straight and so on. We've got a bit more richness in the sky. We've still got all the detail down here, but we pulled the, um, the, the viewing point for the, for the viewer up here to the windmill and up to the sunset. Okay, uh, so that's number one. That was pretty easy. Uh, let's go to one from Peter. So question from Peter was this particular camera, uh, oh, and I can't remember off the top of my head, it was a Sony with a, I think, Minolta lens you mentioned. But anyway, this particular camera and lens um, results in some quite flat images. Um, what can we do to increase contrast in it? So let's start with, um, let's do a little bit of fixing on the lens so it's, it knows that it doesn't have a lens profile for this particular lens capture one doesn't hold it so it said okay we'll use the generic profile for that lens i am going to do the analyze on here which it's done because i've ticked a chromatic aberration um option on a generic lens so capture one knows well we don't have a profile for this lens so we've got to analyze it anyway to work out what to do um at f8 we shouldn't have much in the way of diffraction but i have seen on this image this particular image uh peter oh it's an a7r okay cool um, so what I have seen on this image is that in the corners, we've got a little bit of softness. Um, so it's nice and sharp here. And as it falls out, we've got some softness. That's quite normal in a lot of um, lenses. So you've got these three sliders that help with that. The first is distortion, and we'll come on to that in another image in a minute, because it's quite important. The other one is called sharpness fall off. So this is where whenever you buy a lens um, that, that has, let's say, um, not perfect um, characteristics well they often refer to it as it gets soft at the edges so a lot of lenses are soft at the edges um, especially at certain apertures so effectively you've got a correction for that in this with this with the sharpness fall off and what that's going to do is it's going to make the edges sharper like this 
It's very subtle, but it does have an impact um, without affecting the middle. Because the, the issue with over sharpening the whole image is everything that was sharp then becomes horrible and over sharp. So this is almost like a vignetted sharpening tool, if you think of it like that. So I'm just going to dial it into about there. I know that'll sort of work on here. And then you've also got light fall off. So if you've got a lens that heavily vignettes, um, then you can correct for that in here. It's like a reverse of a vignette. Uh, Kenneth, you've asked, uh, this is your first visit, so what's the name of the program? The program is Capture One, so captureone.com. Um, go there, um, download it, have a little bit of a play and a free trial, um, and then see what you think. Um, there's no purple defringing in here, but let's go on to our exposure tab, and let's see what the image actually has, because I've got a suspicion out here, and, and spoiler alert, I know what's out there because I played with this earlier, um, there's more out there in the sky. There's actually a mountain range out here in the distance. But this looks like it was a pretty hazy day, which doesn't help us. Um, I mean, this was shot at 160 millimeters. I would argue that you could potentially have improved the contrast a little bit with the use of a polarizing filter if there wasn't already on, or wasn't already one on there. If there was, then this was a very hazy day. If it wasn't, try a polarizing filter. You might find that it's cutting some of this, um, some of the bouncing light that's that's causing some of the the loss of detail. However, we can do a lot of this um, on here. So first thing, um, I want to play around a little bit with our white balance. Um, it just seems a little bit too warm and a little, just a touch too greeny. I know obviously grass is green, but the overall image has got a little bit of a green tint, especially when I pull down our detail up here. This isn't quite right, it should be white. So let's pull our white balance. Um, let's go a little bit cooler. I don't know, maybe about there, that'll do. Um, and let's pull our tint up to about mm, about there. All I'm looking at, just for reference, I'm not looking at this area down here, I'm looking at this area up here to make sure this is neutral, because if it was sky and it was washed out, it would be neutral um, up there. Okay. So with that neutralized, um, let's pull our exposure back to how it was. Okay. Uh, let's just actually, let's just try a very simple um, highlight and white recovery. So if I pull down our highlights across the whole image, so I'm not drawing any filter, I'm not drawing any gradient uh, mask or anything like that. And let's pull our whites down a little bit as well. So the whites, remember, is only affecting the top 10% of the image. And look at what that's doing to the histogram. So it, it's taking it in um, to the middle. Now, here's the thing. Typically, when an image has not very much contrast, this is the, the histogram that we'd see. So contrast comes from a histogram being stretched as far as it can be. So it means that you've got very dark, dark areas and very bright, bright areas. And that histogram would be from the zero line up to the 255 line um, up here. By recovering, so using high dynamic range, um, what you're effectively doing is pulling down the stuff from the edges, from the highlights or from the shadows. Uh, let's have a look. You set each layer at 100% opacity. Wouldn't it be more flexible to have it to... Uh, yeah, so Paul's, uh, Paul's just asked a, a good question. Let me just put it on there. Um, let me go back to, very quickly, this image of Dean's. So what Paul's referring to is I've set every layer to 100% opacity. Um, wouldn't it be a better idea to set each layer to 50? And then that would give me some latitude to go stronger or or less if I wanted to. Honestly, Paul, it's a fair challenge. Um, it, it's personal choice. Um, what I tend to do is go as far as I could possibly want to go. So in other words, I have a, a visual stop that says, woo, that's too much, and then come back from there. You can, of course, get to a point where, okay, that's a reasonable amount, and then you can add more to it and take away um, some if you wanted to by, by setting. So in other words, rather than um, this sky gradient being designed at plus 36 on saturation at 100, if I put this at 50% and did the saturation at 72, that has exactly the same effect. So it, it's a fair call, which says if you set it to 50%, it gives you some more leeway. You could go more, um, so I could then increase that here. Um, but it's just a personal thing that says, personally, what I tend to do is have it at 100, and I will always put the sliders as far as I want them to go. Um, in other words, don't go any more than that and then always um, scale back if I want to later on. But yes, fair challenge, um, it, it's just personal preference. So on our, um, on our uh, lack of contrast image, so what we've actually done is we've introduced a lack of contrast by doing the recovery stuff. And in fact, I could make it even worse. So if you look at this histogram, when I pull up the shadows, 
and the black areas, we, again, we're getting less contrast. So I've now got this, this struggle because I want all the detail from back here, and I can only get that by pulling the highlights down, but I want more contrast. So what we're going to do, we are going to use clarity for a start. So I'm going to create a new filled layer. Um, and again, so in this case, I've, I'm set at 100. It could equally be set at 50, um, like Paul was saying. And oh, let's just get rid of you off of there. Sorry. Um, so we could set that to 50 and we could go overboard with the clarity. Um, and then effectively, I could then increase it if I wanted to or decrease it later on. Um, but so for now, I'm going to leave it at 100. Um, I'm going to pull our clarity up to about there. OK, that's introduced some more detail. We've got a bit more contrast. But actually, there's a tool that we very rarely use in here, and I'm going to use it now, which is the contrast tool. So if you watch the histogram, I'm going to go over the top in doing this. But watch the histogram at the top left of the screen. And as I increase contrast, it's doing exactly what I just said, which is it's stretching out that histogram. And it's making the light areas light and the dark areas darker. But look at what it's done to the image. It's made it horrible. It's made it too contrasty. So it, is, it doesn't make sense to our eyes that if there's mist in the image, that everything would be clear. So let's use a little bit of contrast, but the rest we're going to do just with our clarity tool. So this foreground area here, I think, is actually OK. But we're going to create two little um, gradient masks uh, just to help us. So I'm just going to call this layer clarity so it reminds me of what it was. I'm going to create a new empty layer. And this one we're going to call foreground. And on our foreground, we're going to create a very subtle little gradient layer. It's going to finish about there. It's going to fall off very uh, very slowly. And with this layer, I'm going to use our color editor. So we go to the color tab, top left. And on this one, we're going to go into our color editor. So the new thing in version 20 is that rather than having to choose your colors, which you could always do um, through the pinwheel, um, so effectively, I could choose a, a color in here on the advanced tool always, and I could make these adjustments. Um, but instead of doing that, I can now just use this little picker thing here and say, right, that's the color that I'm looking at. And then with my mouse, I can increase the or change the hue to be more green or more orange. I can change the saturation by going up and down with the mouse. And if I hold down the option key, I can make it darker or I can make it lighter. So really powerful tool. Um, you can get very, very, very lost um, if you use it uh, a bit over the top um, and, and move your mouse too much, basically. So be careful with that. But in this case, I want the green grass to be quite rich and green. So I'm going to increase our hue just to be more on the green side than the yellow side that it started. And I'm going to increase our saturation a touch. But I'm then going to use, and I don't have to use the mouse on the image, I can then actually use this slider. So I'm going to pull the lightness down a touch. OK, that's a bit too much for my liking. So we're just going to do that there. So I can turn this layer off like that and on like that. So already we've got a lot more richness in the grass. And that's good. But what about this background? So very simple, new layer. Uh, let's call it sky. And with our gradient mask, again, a really soft gradient, we are going to be left with some mist in here. But with that mask, which it looks like this, I'm actually going to just use the option key again, just like I did earlier, which allows me to get closer to this line. You can see why I've drawn the mask in this direction. If I really wanted to be um, picky about it, I could use a luma range to exclude this tree, or I could use an advanced mask to exclude that tree, but I don't think it's going to matter. Instead, we're just going to go straight to our Exposure tab up here and Clarity. And we're going to pull up the Clarity and we're going to pull up the Structure. So remember, Clarity is an area um, change. So it's, a, it's the mid-tones and the greys. Structure is looking for edges. And what we have got out here in these trees is quite a lot of structure. So by using this Structure tool, uh, but only in the sky, we can pull it out. Don't do it too much. Just like in the previous image, if you do it too much, you're going to end up with horrible halos and nasty stuff all around the image. Um, so use these two things sparingly, but that will improve the amount of contrast that you've got in the image. What I can also do now is I can start to pull that line down a little bit of the mask so I don't get a bit of a, a light area down here that I don't want. OK, now what I can do up here is then specifically on the sky, pull down the highlights and the whites a little bit more. So that gets us a lot more detail in there. And I can pull down our exposure. 
Uh, so David's just asked, why do we sometimes create an empty layer and other times not for a gradient layer? Um, so we'll always for a gradient, we'll always create an empty layer. Um, for a, if we want the whole image to be filled, then we create a filled layer. So let me just um, create a new layer just to show you. So I'll turn the mask on. If I create an empty layer, which is the same as holding down and going to empty or just clicking it very quickly once, nothing on the image has been affected. And then I go to my gradient tool and as I draw, it's going to have the effect of having a mask over where I draw. If I, let me just delete that layer. If I were to create a, let me just turn that off a second, it's going to confuse you. Hold down the mouse button and create a filled layer. What that's done is it's filled the entire image with 100%. So as a result, then when I draw a gradient, I can undo that fill for sure. But it wouldn't make sense to start with the filled layer and then draw a gradient over the top. So typically for a gradient, you're going to start with an empty layer. If you do start with a filled layer by accident, it doesn't matter. The second you start drawing a gradient, it's going to replace the filled layer with a gradient anyway. But if you want to affect everything in the whole image, then it's going to be a filled layer to start with. Okay, uh, so with the overall image, we have pulled up a lot of detail up here in the sky. But what we've also got as a result of that mist is a slight blue um, tint to everything. So remember, we can also change the white balance independently on each of the layers. So with this, I'm just going to warm up that background just a bit, not too much, just about there. Okay, and then what that allows me to do, I can create now, if I want, one of those filled layers. So again, everything that is done to this layer applies to everything on the whole image, because it's all 100%, unless I change this opacity at the top. So with this filled layer, I can now start playing with my levels. So I can pull our brightnesses in and I can pull our shadows in there. Okay, cool. So um, that's probably where we leave this image in terms of keeping it um, natural. Where we're at though, let me just show you. Here's the original and here's our version that's been enhanced. Um, each of those layers remember. So what I've done is I've gone to the maximum that we probably would um, to make it um, remain realistic. Each of them though, we can pull back from. So if we look at the original image, and I would always encourage you to do this, whenever you're editing, go back to the original image just to double check stuff before um, sending this one off to print. And if you think actually that's a bit too strong in the background, well, that's okay. So let's go to our sky layer and we'll just reduce that down to maybe 80. We might wanna reduce the overall clarity. So that layer up here, uh, and our levels, maybe we want to undo that a little bit. Of course, I could go into the individual tool, but the advantage of doing it with the layer opacity is I can play with it um, independently of, of everything else and, and still keep a record of it. So I know where it was to start with, and I've got a, a bit of a reference. So I go from that, it looks going, it's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but I agree. Um, uh, who was it, Peter? Yeah, I agree with it. So it's a little bit washed out. Um, just with a few tweaks in terms of clarity and contrast, you can get back to this and get all that detail back in the background too. Okay, um, let's go on to an image with a little gotcha that I'll show you. Oh, sorry, I've got a question from Paul. Uh, so apologies for missed it prior my video. Use the create fill layer, make adjustments to taste, and then clear mask and... Uh, um, I'm just uh, so I think I know what you mean. Um, so what I it, it depends on what you, yeah it depends on where you want to go. Um, you can work in two different ways. I can create. Let's imagine I wanted to just for for um, argument's sake, I'm going to create a layer which um, let's get rid of that. I'm going to create a filled layer, and this particular layer I wanted it to be warm and pink. Okay. So the reason everything is turned warm and pink is because that filled layer has affected the entire image. I can now, if I want to, use the eraser tool and I can undo bits of the pink. And I can control the opacity of that brush, I can control the size of it and so on. Equally, what I could do is I could, undo, I could unfill the entire layer uh, so I can clear the mask. So I've made my adjustment so what, what some people will do is they'll do the fill mask, they'll make their adjustments. Uh, so let's imagine I wanted this to be clarity, structure, so let's lower the exposure, let's increase our saturation, let's make it horrible. Okay, so that's the, the look that I'm going for. Um, not really, but you know what I mean. Um, right click on here and clear it. What this would allow me to do then, if I wanted to, with my brush, 
if I wanted to set that to maybe a third opacity, I could start brushing that change on. And if you were to look behind the scenes at what's actually happening with the mask, let me just put the grayscale mask on so you can see, everywhere I'm now brushing is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger to whatever setting it was that I did on this particular layer. So that might be a bit complex, but there's two ways of approaching it. One is that we um, mask the areas that we want, make those changes, and then if we're not happy with them, we can adjust the mask. So that may start with a filled mask and then erasing, or it may be um, a Luma mask. Um, then the other option is absolutely you can, if you want, um, do a fill mask or fill layer for everything. So you can see everything that's going to happen to the image. Um, and then you can just paint in, so you can clear the mask, and then you can paint in the changes that you wanted to make. My challenge with doing that, if I'm honest, is especially if I'm trying to adjust, oops, hit the mouse a bit funny for some reason. Um, even if I'm, if I'm trying to adjust one particular area of the image, I don't want to be distracted by the changes it's going to make to other areas on the image. So for example, if I only wanted to change this house down here and I wanted to change its clarity, in my head, creating a filled layer um, so this layer is now everything. So I'd now go into this house and let's say we're going to push up that clarity to a huge extent. Okay. And we're going to also, I don't know, maybe we're going to change the color editor. Um, we're going to make all the greens a little greener, uh, a little more saturated and so on, but just around this house. The problem is I'm now distracted by all of this. Um, so I'm making decisions, whenever I'm making a decision, I'm not making a decision just on this house. I'm making a decision on how that house looks in the overall image. And if I'm changing everything in the image at once, granted, with the intention of clearing that and then going to my brush tool and brushing it in, then the result of that first thing means it's jaded my view of the whole image. It's changed how I'm looking at the image. So personally, I would always add to an empty layer. Some people choose to um, do it as a filled layer and then paste it in or paint it in later. Personal choice. Uh, okay, next ooh, question um, <laughs> from Bruce. David will remind you to remove the question now. I, I, I did. Um, however, um, the reason I left it up there was so that people had context and they didn't think I was making this picture look horrible and pink. Um, so uh, another question. I'd like to know if you're able to change the brush you're setting and capture one like in Photoshop. Yes, you can. Um, so with the brush, I can either click on this little icon here, which is the brush settings icon. Um, so I can change size, hardness, opacity, and flow. Um, you can have it treat like a, an airbrush. We can do auto masking. We'll cover that in a later session at some point. Um, or I can right click anywhere in the image when I'm on a brush and I get the same pop-up. What is quite useful, if you're doing a lot of backward and forward stuff, um, so adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting, there is this option here to link the brush and eraser settings. So when I make a change to my brush, what sometimes happens is people, feel, so we set our brush to say 30% opacity, then we switch to a razor and start, oh, that's a bad, oh, stupid me. Uh, if I unlink them. <laughs> so on my eraser, I've got it to 100, and then I go to my brush and start painting and think, oh, why is that odd? Because that was set at 30. Whereas if I go back to my eraser, it's at 100, go to my brush, it's down at 30. If you're constantly doing a razor brush, a razor brush to, to tidy up an area, it can be quite useful to tick this box, link brush and eraser settings, which means whatever you do in one is going to affect the other as well. I can save a bit of time. Okay, uh, let's go on to this shot, uh, Esteban. Okay, so this one is Japan, uh, I think. Um, and there's a couple of things on here that I just want to cover. Um, hopefully they'll help some of you as well um, going forward. So the first thing is what we can recover and what we can't. So we talked about in the first image that shadows, when we try and recover them, we bring back noise. It's not ideal, but we can recover them. Highlights, once they're blown out and we've lost detail, there's no way we can pull back detail that's overexposed. And in here we can see this is overexposed. If I turn my exposure warning on, it's way, way over. Um, as a general rule, if you're photographing a light, then the light is going to be bright. The light at night is probably going to be overexposed. That makes sense. As a tip, try and expose to make sure that the brightest part of a structure, if it is lit, isn't overexposed. And then the shadows we can try and recover later. So in this case, it doesn't matter what I try and do with my, so let's use a highlight recovery. It just can't bring any detail back in there because these sections were 
just off the off the edge of the camera. The camera couldn't see that in its dynamic range. Whereas if we'd underexposed it a little bit, we would be able to pull back quite a lot of this shadow while still protecting this. So the temptation in, in, in nighttime, especially with the camera, if you have your camera trying to auto meter for you, it's gonna try and put everything as, as middle gray, and it's gonna have a tendency to overexpose um, some of the image. So generally speaking, you wanna underexpose, if anything, if you're shooting um, in darkness with lights, and then pull back the shadows if you can, as long as you've got dynamic range um, scope in your camera. Okay, the first thing I want to show you in this image, though, um, is a little thing that Capture One does when you load in certain lens profiles. So this is an ultra-wide lens. It's a Sony uh, 10 to 18 millimeters. That's, that's going to be a very wide lens with almost a, a fisheye. I think maybe it has a fisheye. If not, it's got, certainly got a very rounded front um, element. When I pull this image in and uh, loads in this lens profile, you see here it sets the distortion to 100. If I go to my crop tool, and show the image where have we gone let's oh it's because i'm not zoomed out right so if i load in the image it looks okay there let me go to my crop tool i've got all this extra image to the right and to the left and a little bit up and down that capture one has just discarded it's actually thrown it out um, and what it said is because i know that this lens distorts quite a lot when i do my distortion correction so if i set that to zero it knows that there's some pincushion going on in this lens. So to correct that distortion and basically make the middle bit bigger, the distortion correction is actually going to have the effect of cropping the image in. Now, for some of us, so I have a, a series of ultra-wide lenses. I don't want Capture One to do that. So just be very careful when you're pulling in an image that's using an ultra-wide lens. If Capture One automatically pulls in the distortion, it's probably done a good job of it. It's probably straightened everything up and stopped everything bowing but you might have lost some of the image to the left and right, and you might not want to do that. So let me go to a one by three ratio on this one. I'm actually going to lose some of this foreground in here. And that allows me manually now to pull to the very edge of the image. So I'm not losing any of this. I'm not losing any of that because even with that distortion correction in there, I've gone beyond what Capture One would recommend. Now that might not be a good idea. It might be that it's recommended that because these edges here are not particularly sharp. Uh, maybe they know that in the lens profile we've got some aberration stuff going on, I don't know. Um, let's analyze this image and let's turn on our purple defringing because I can see it on that building there. And I'm also gonna turn on some sharpness fall off. So that's just like before, we know that at the edge of this lens it might be a little unsharp. Um, so with those two changes, I'm correcting for most of what's going on at the edges, but Capture One as default would have pulled that in and we would have chopped off quite a significant chunk because it's on an ultra wide lens. So just be careful if you do that in future, if you bring in an image from an ultra wide lens, have a look at your crop first if Capture One has done this little automatic tick of distortion to 100. Uh, on this image though, the rest of it, so let's have a look. First off, let's straighten it. So we've got a rather handy horizon-ish here, uh, which we can use. That looks a bit better. Okay, cool. Um, we might want to do a little bit of keystoning because I can see this building here is bowing out um, to the left as it goes up. So very, very small amount of keystoning, but it may help our bridge stay a bit more vertical. So I'm gonna do the same on each side, a little bit of a bow. Yeah, so that's about the same angle. That's better. Um, now, when I've made that keystone correction, I'm also gonna change our crop position a little bit to about there. That's looking pretty good, okay. And then what we can do, so we know that we can't necessarily recover all of the detail on this bridge, um, but what we can do is we can pull back what we what we can get away with. So let's pull back the highlights, let's pull back the whites as much as we can. That's also gonna help with some of these little um, spotlights here. We'll pull the shadows up a touch. I'm not gonna touch the black. The reason is because I still want some definition. And when we saw, if I pull up the blacks and the shadows and pull down the highlights and the whites, we lose all of our contrast. Cities don't work if there's no contrast in them. So let's leave the black a little bit down there. And then what I'm going to do is just balance out the white balance, or the white balance, what am I talking about? Balance out the illumination in this image. So we're going to use two gradients to do that. So the first is going to be from the bottom, um, base. You can call these whatever you like. I'm going to hold down the shift key. And when I do that, it's going to snap to be 90 degrees. This is a good test to let you know whether or not you've got the uh, horizon straight because as I pull the gradient up, it should be straight across the horizon. Okay, that looks good um, with our nice soft gradient. 
and with that one we're going to pull our exposure down a bit now look at what's happening because it's darkening this side more than that side and the reason is this side was darker the sun was setting by the look of it over there so i'm going to actually rotate this even though it was originally straight just to even up this side so now i can get away with even more of an exposure drop there and it has the effect of evening up this bottom. So rather than the right hand side being darker than the left, we've now evened that up. And the same is going to apply in the sky. So let's create a new mask called sky. Again, um, David, for your reference, so empty mask. If I press the M button, it's going to show nothing. But the second I start drawing a gradient, um, what we're going to see is there. There's our mask on the gradient. Okay. And with that one, I'm going to turn the mask off. And we're going to lower our exposure a bit more there. That's looking good. Now, again, when we've changed our exposure, what we're exposing is some of the color in the sky, and it's got a little bit of a green tint to it. So what we're going to do is maybe cool this down. Uh, I think in one of the sessions before, we talked about the, the fact that cities typically have a cooler tone um, at night. And we're going to fix our tint a little bit because it's quite green. So let's move well, on that much. Let's go to about there. That's good. So we've still got Rainbow Bridge there um, in its correct original colors but um, we've fixed this color change up here a little bit. Overall, I could actually get away with pulling down our overall white balance and tint there too. Okay, so if I create a clone, uh, this is our original. And there's our finished one. Um, so it's a subtle difference, but it's, it's leveled everything up. It's made it all even. We've also got some of the image back on the left and right hand side of the, the frame as well. Okay, uh, let's do, we've got time for one more. Let's do another one. Uh, let's go to this one. So an ST image. Um, we get rid of the browser. And okay, this is one where we don't want to bring in contrast, or not too much anyway. Uh, if we bring in too much contrast, we're going to end up with um, losing the, the effect and the feel of this. We've got these lovely little sun um, rays coming out from here. So firstly, let's check our lens. It's picked up the right lens. Um, let's do an analyze on our chromatic aberration. And at f22, there is probably some diffraction in there. So we'll just tick that for the sake of it, just for now. Um, I don't think there's much in the way of purple fringing. Mm, maybe a touch. So we'll just slide that up a little bit, just to help. OK, um, first thing with this. Um, is the white balance so you've got some amazing colors in this um but i just want to make sure that it feels right so i am actually going to warm up this shot a little bit because the sun's low it should feel a bit warmer than it currently did um, but i'm also going to fix that tint um, so this is again from green up to pink we don't want it too pink we don't want it too green um, but where it was which is sort of around here there's a little bit of a green tint up here um, which doesn't quite make sense so i'm just going to fix that a bit Let's go to about there. That's a bit better. Okay, overall, I can increase our clarity. So what I don't want to do again is overall contrast. I don't want to be stretching out the contrast in this shot. What I do want to do is in these mid-tones, so certainly out here, seeing a bit more detail. And I can use the clarity slider. It's perfect for this because it's a mid-tone enhancer. So if you look at what I do, when I go from zero up to, let's go too far, to 100, you see all of this detail now coming out on all these stripes of this sun. So this is a really good tool. It's, a re it's the perfect tool, actually, for this, for getting some definition in all of this stuff. Um, OK, so that's cool for this bit. But what about the sky? Because what I can see on here, unfortunately, is ST was either using a <laughs> Uh, lens with lots of dust spots on and f22 this is what they'd look like or a filter with lots of dust spots or rain spots or something like that possibly water so things like this we can fix with the dust spot tool or with a healing brush there we go um, but things like this up here ooh, we're going to end up reconstructing the image so i've got a better plan i think um, let's go on to our new layer and we're going to create a nice little gradient so to there i am going to use the luma range because i want to discount anything that's in the mid-tones i only want to affect Ooh, actually that's going to be a problem isn't it uh okay so here's a challenge for you these here these mountains are about the same luminosity as this part in the sky up here so we may not be able to do it with the luma range we might actually have to do it with um some erasing but let's just uh turn that off for now 
let's go up to here and what I'm going to do is create a harder fall off for this mask okay now I don't know if you remember on Friday we covered one where what we said was we could use the clarity tool in reverse just to smooth things out so I'm going to do the same here I'm going to try it so with this mask we know it's affecting the top part where all these um, little mottled things are um, without affecting anything down here so let's pull our clarity all the way down it's done a pretty good job it's got rid of most of it now what I can do again just like with highlight recovery and um, high dynamic range tools I can create a new mouse so I could either well, let's, let's just go for a double down but only in this section here because I can see that some of the mottled stuff is still up here it's not affecting down here I don't want to change too much down here but up here we've still got some so with that one I'm going to pull clarity down again so we get a double effect of pulling that clarity down if I turn those two off you see all these dots and then let's turn the two on together and we've got rid of a lot of it not all of it but we've got rid of a lot of it we could also pull down contrast in that top layer that would help a little bit um, and we could of course pull up our saturation a touch just to keep it nice and warm and glowing um, possibly the final thing and it's also going to help with this I'm going to change our crop with this image um, so I'm just going to do a one by two instead of a, a classic sort of three by two um, so we're going to get this horizon line on the one third line that means that this falls nicely on the top one third line and the sun rather handily is also on the one third line so as a crop that's good now there's one thing that I still need to fix and it's it's upsetting me that I see it um, but I don't know whether anyone else has you see this sun flare here um, no problem with that this is a really nice image um, it, it really works um, <laughs> David's just asked are we trying to avoid that wonderful heel tool uh, yes I am actually so the, here's the issue with the heel tool on this one um, let me go back to our, our previous crop um, in fact let me not do that up here where all this mottled stuff was there was so much of it I don't know where I'd heal from so I'd end up having to um, copy bits and paste them and, and, and I'd end up with a bit of a mashup and then I'd still have to take the clarity down. It's just easier in this case just to use reverse clarity just to smooth out that sky. And actually in, in lots of cases it happens with a really, uh, a really good effect. Um, if you ever want the sky to just lose some of its detail then use the clarity tool in reverse but only on the sky. Don't do it on the whole image. If you, if you did it on the whole image, let me show you. It's a great filled layer. Uh, turn off that crop. And if I do clarity in reverse we get even more mist, which can be a nice effect, but in this case, it's quite nice to have these uh, mountains quite hard. What's wrong though, is this uh, reflection. So this is still water. This is presumably level water and the sun is there. What doesn't make sense is the reflection isn't coming straight down. It's coming off to the side, it's coming off to the left. Um, the reason is that this was probably a, well, it is a wide lens, isn't it? It's uh, 24 to 70, it was shot at 32, and it was probably looking up a little bit, which means that we've got some um, parallax effect going on. We know this is really easy to fix, so a straighten tool is not going to make any difference, but our keystone one will. And we can see, actually, when we load in the keystone tool, immediately that angle there. I'm going to actually be a bit cheeky. I'm going to leave the right-hand side as it is. I'm going to just pull the left-hand side, because I don't want to lose anything on that crop. So let's use actually this line here of reflection. Line it up with that sun. So this is quite neat. There we go. So the sun and the reflection, we know that they should be vertical and aligned. So let's hit the apply button. Okay, that's made a horrible impact on this on this straightness of the image. But we can fix that in two ways. We can use the straighten tool, or I could actually mimic um, that same line on the right hand side like we did earlier. In this case, I'm going to use the straighten tool just to double check. So we use the straighten tool across the horizon there. Nice. And if I now pull our crop to be as big as we can get it and keep it on that one third. Where are we there? So look at what the keystone tool's done. It's lost a lot of detail um, because of this trapezoid shape, but it was detail I didn't want anyway. I was going to get rid of it through that um, reverse clarity. But that, to me, looks quite nice. Let's create a clone. So here's our original there. Um, nothing wrong with it. We've just got some of this stuff. If we wanted to see that model effect even more, if we put the clarity up and our contrast up, we can see all these dust spots up here, dust or water spots. So by using that reverse clarity and by then pulling in some of the crop to get rid of the worst of it up here, we end up with that, which is a much nicer image, um, nice and calm, would actually look quite nice on the wall. 
Okay, um, so I think that's it for today. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, put them up now and we'll try and answer them. Uh, we can stay on for a couple of seconds if we need to. Um, otherwise, we will see you um, for the next set of images on Friday, this Friday, so the 17th. Um, that's at one o'clock in the UK, so that's uh, bright and early at 8am in New York or not quite so late at 8 p.m. in Hong Kong. Um, for those of you that want to send images in, make sure you use this tool. Um, so you go to, oops, let me just, why have we got a weird thing on there from David Grover from a previous session? That's a bit weird. Um, not sure where that came from. Okay, um, so on the upload tool, uh, go to poorreforlive.wetransfer.com. You can upload your raw file. We will edit them as and when we get them, if we can, um, although some may be backed up into a later one. And um, from that point, um, hopefully you'll see it on the screen. Uh, Andrew Simpson has just asked, can you not use negative clarity before you increase it to start? Uh, yes, you, you can. Um, so absolutely, uh, in, in this particular image, that's, that's kind of what we did. So effectively, the only reason I put the clarity up on this one was so that you could see it. Um, the clarity on the overall image, um, if I go to our background, um, I could have ignored that. I could have tried to undo that. What we can do, though, actually, is instead of doing clarity at zero on here, what I can do is create a new empty layer. Let's be a bit more specific about it. With our brush set to 100, Let's paint a mask over the area that I want, like that, so you can see. Very rough, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then with that particular layer, so only that layer, we could obviously increase the clarity just on these mountains. It's having such a small effect, though, just on this area here. Um, and up here, we've got some nastiness going on up there, so let's just remove that up there. Either way is fine. Um, it doesn't really matter. We can stack it as well. Um, but either way, that's just done personal preference. Um, cool. So hopefully that all makes sense. As I say, um, send us stuff through. Um, there's the tool, poorreforlive.wetransfer.com. And uh, from there, we will download your files. We'll see you or those of you that want to go along on Friday at 1 p.m. in the UK or 8 in New York and 8 in Hong Kong. Cool. Catch you later. Bye.